Hello everyone, welcome back. Um, I'm going to be doing some more video lectures for our class today. Um, and this is the kind of first uh, scheduled um, one like I was talking about in my introductory welcome video. Um, I'm going to be trying to stay on this schedule of Tuesdays and Thursdays, 12.30 to 2.30. Um, hey, someone showed up. Hey, awesome. Um, welcome. Um, anyone who is... Oh, they just left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I might be pausing the video from time to time here as I'm trying to help people connect here too. So um, I will be, uh, there might be some interruptions here, but we'll get it all working. Um, hopefully there will be some people who are capable of attending uh, for these times. So I'm not just talking into a box all by myself, but if that has to happen, you know, it's okay. I can deal with that. Um, but uh, today the plan is to talk about the code of intellectual conduct. And I'm going to keep this video to two hours and maybe a little less than that. We'll see how far we can get. I might have to talk more about this on Thursday. Um, but uh, there's a lot of stuff to unpack from what is really a very short document. Um, but I want to try to uh, flesh it out as much as possible for you. Um, if anyone is attending these live, um, if you're watching this later and you're thinking about maybe showing up to one of these, I really encourage anyone who's in the chat to be vocal and jump in with questions and comments and things as we're going. Uh, don't worry about like interrupting me in my lectures or something like that. I know I know my way around these lectures and I'm not going to get disrupted or you're going to throw me off my game or anything like that. And the more that um, people do participate live, the better these lectures are going to get. So um, very much I encourage that. Um, I've got a little chat window up and I'm able to watch it the whole time. So getting into things for today, um, I showed you a little bit of that intro lecture um, yesterday, the, the thing that's called the intro lecture up in the file section. And I use, um, at, right at the beginning of that lecture, there's a discussion of the, the goods and the bads, right? The, the advantages and the risks of approaching life in this kind of paradigm of critical thinking. I mentioned how there's other ways that we have of uh, engaging with these decisions about what to believe and how to act other than doing it through this particular somewhat idiosyncratic methodology. Uh, like I was saying yesterday, critical reasoning is an ethical life uh, um, lifestyle. So uh, I like to own up to that and to, to have this kind of critical evaluation of um, what is this good for and what are the potential problems with it. Um, and usually when I'm teaching this class in person, we make a huge like class discussion out of it. And I, I really like doing that. And unfortunately the online format doesn't give us as uh, an easy way to do that really quickly. But I do encourage people to post um, comments in uh, on the discussion boards uh, in reaction to videos and lectures that are happening and if you've got some thoughts about this that you'd like to add to supplement to the discussion I'm going to be giving then I, I very much would uh, encourage you to do that. Um, the, the intro lecture lists some things that people have mentioned in the past about it and I'll let you peruse that and take a look at it for your own. But I'm not going to do a huge review of it in this lecture today other than I mention it because there, there just are problems with uh, critical thinking as a form of life. And that's not to um, invalidate any of its huge advantages and its benefits and what's really awesome about it and why I would encourage people, you know, uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this hat turning thing. I'll do this hat turning thing to indicate that I'm very much not intending to speak with any kind of authority as the instructor or something like that. Just, just a person who's got some thoughts I want to share with you. Um, for m my money, I think the critical reasoning paradigm is a really, really valuable one to integrate into anyone's life. Um, and it's to, to not have it as a part of your life is very problematic in itself. Um, but even with acknowledging all those advantages, it still has these deficiencies, it still has these risks. Um, and the code of intellectual conduct, which is my main goal to present to, to you today, I think is usefully framed as an attempt to proceed with that activity, with this mode of engagement, in a way that 
enjoys all the benefits of those advantages while trying to avoid the risks, um, trying to dodge the things that can be problematic about it. Um, and this is like a lot of things in life, right? It's not all good, it's not all bad, but there's the potential for this and the potential for that. And that just means we've got to be a little bit more careful and uh, intentional about how we engage with this stuff. Um, I think the Code of Intellectual Conduct is one of the most useful aspects of the curriculum that we're going to be looking at this quarter, actually. I'm not going to be testing you on the code, but I would definitely want it to give you it because um, I think it's a valuable resource and frame of reference for how to think about everything that we're doing in the course proper. So it sets a kind of context for how, why these other skills matter, uh, some of the rational standards we have for evaluating arguments, um, but also just giving like the spirit in which it should all happen. I mentioned on the last video that sometimes teaching this class makes me feel like an arms dealer where I give you all these tools, but you can use those tools for all sorts of purposes. The Code of Intellectual Conduct is trying to give direction on how to use the tools. And that's where it feels to me to be a very essential part of the curriculum and a very um, insightful one. Um, I don't think the code is perfect, though, and you'll see that from me as we go here. Um, I, uh, in, I use the code in a lot of my classes as a way to kind of kick off the quarter, um, and especially in those classes uh, like my intro class or when I'm teaching ethics, where we're going to get into debates over the course of the quarter. Um, it takes on even more significance as a practical guide for how we're going to engage with each other. And actually, just to let you know, because I'm not going to be doing this uh, with us, we're, we're, we're not going to be getting into debates in this class. That's not um, the focus of, of, of what we're working on. Um, if people want to get into debates, I'm always down for that. And there's probably going to be a lot of little philosophical issues that are going to come up tangentially with the curriculum that maybe we could have some debates about. For the most part, this class is designed around those uh, standards of rationality and logic that are uncontroversial, or relatively uncontroversial. But everything gets debated in philosophy, including reason itself and logic itself. And there are some issues that are controversial, and I will be sort of mentioning those things as they come up or where they're connected with the things that we're talking about. But in those other classes where we do get into the debates and I'm presenting the code, I usually frame it for them as um, almost like a proposal, like, like a contract that I'm proposing to the class about like something that we would pledge to agree to that's going to um, set direction of, of what we're at least trying to do and how we're going to try to go about doing it. Um, we may not do that perfectly. We don't always act in a way that's in accordance with all of these principles and maxims that are on the code, but uh, it, it gives us a foundation of goodwill and trust about what we're aiming to do or what we think would be ideal, what we're, what we're going to, to try to do. Um, so that, that, that practical aspect is not here so much for our class directly. However, if you're thinking about using anything that you learn in this class out into the world um, beyond just taking this class, then I think it is very, very helpful. Um, I don't, uh, it's not like every time I sit down and have a discussion or a debate with someone, I'm like, please read this code of intellectual conduct. But so, there are cases in which um, when you're just sort of having a debate with someone or when I have a debate with someone, that I'm like, sometimes like we need to take a time out from this and maybe get on the same page about what we're here to do and how we want to go about doing it. Um, I think violations of these principles on the code are usually involved, uh, or they, they, the conversations that end up violating them have a tendency to get unproductive, to get abusive, to get problematic very, very quickly. And in fact, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, um, or my other, my last welcome video, uh, this code is taken from a text that we're going to be using for the informal fallacies at the end of the quarter. And uh, Edward Damer, the guy who wrote this book, Attacking Faulty Reasoning, uses the principles to organize the fallacies, that basically these different argumentative mistakes are uh, grouped based on which principles from the code that they violate, which ones they're not taking as seriously as they need to. Um, so that's a little bit of background here for what's going on uh, and how I encourage you to think about the Code of Intellectual Conduct um, and my purpose in sharing it with you. Um, it, it paints a 
a picture for how to engage. That's that's really what it's about, and um, it's uh, some somewhat of a culture shift, I think. Sometimes um, I might have I don't think I told this story yesterday or my my welcome lecture, but uh, when I first started teaching, I remember I. Uh, Got, I was getting papers and stuff from students, and I got really depressed really fast because <laughs> it was like all of the papers I was getting from students were terrible argumentative techniques. And I'm not just talking about like illogical inferences or something like that, but more about these behavioral things like toxic, abusive, argumentative tricks, rhetorical techniques rather than sincere argumentation or sincere truth seeking, lots of dogmatism ad hominem attacks, straw men, all that kind of stuff. And it was just one of those kinds of experiences of like, this is the generation of the future, like what is happening? And then I chilled out on that a little bit. And um, I realized, well, one, their generation's no different than previous ones and having problems on that level. But also uh, that it really wasn't like my students were actually so insincere. Um, or intending to be abusive or anything like that. Um, as I got to know my students, uh, apart from their writing and having conversations with them and getting to know their personalities and everything and, and what their attitude is, I was like, oh, your attitude is not the way it's coming through in your writing. Um, and the hypothesis that I've sort of landed on for explaining this aspect um, or these patterns is that it's really just, I, I think my students are emulating the type of argumentative practices that they see modeled around them in the rest of society. And a lot of the rest of society does not engage in debates in a way that's involved with sincere truth-seeking and charity for the opponent and all that good stuff that we're going to be talking about from the Code of Intellectual Conduct. Um, and when you hear someone arguing for something or having a debate, especially a public debate, and you're like, oh, that was convincing. Like, I'm convinced by this person. They're good at arguing you may just model their behaviors um, and uh, and sort of absorb them and adopt them. So another reason why I like presenting the code is to just give a different type of vision uh, to emulate that I think is healthier, more productive, more sincere, uh, more ethical, um, all those values that are at stake here. Um, okay, so that maybe that's enough preliminaries here. Um, let me pull up the code here. And so you'll see it on screen if you're watching this later. Um, and oh, oh wait, there's another way I wanted to do this, so I can have the little. Um, uh, what do I need to do here? Okay, here's what I can do. There we go. Okay, all right. So um, getting into it, uh, the actual details of the code of intellectual conduct. Uh, there's two sort of sections uh, to notice here. One is the standards for the code itself, and I'm going to have a lot of things to say about that. And then the actual principles, uh, these 12 principles um, that give guidance for how we should act. But I really appreciate a couple things about Edward Damer's version of this. This is not some kind of like industry standard sort of thing. There isn't, there's, there's a lot of different philosophers that have attempted to give this kind of description of the intellectual virtues or different versions of this kind of code of conduct kind of thing. Um, this is one of my favorites. I, I, like I said, I don't think it's perfect. I'm going to have some suggestions about how to modify it. Um, but there's a couple things that it's doing right out of the gates that make it very noteworthy um, in, in my opinion. One of them is that it talks about the standards themselves. So it's not just like a bunch of arbitrary principles. Like, like if I was saying here are the rules of my classroom, and it's just like follow the rules, obey kind of thing. Um, there's accountability for the code itself. It's saying here's what we're trying to accomplish with designing this code. That these codes, the principles on the code are justified and worthy of being followed for the sake of these purposes. Um, at, to boil it down, it's in its most simple form as out of concern for the truth, or the next best thing, we'll talk more about that, and um, in for concerns of ethics about how we're treating each other in context of disagreement. Those are the two priorities here that we want to have the rules that when followed give us the best chance of succeeding at these two goals. Um, 
I talk, I describe these as being, the, one of them is about the product or end of our efforts, and the other one is about our attitudes or the means that we take in order to get to that destination or to reach that goal. So both of those are the priorities that justify these principles. And a lot of the adjustments I'd want to make to the Code of Intellectual Conduct come from how I think the, the principles could be worded or changed in such a way that we're actually going to have a better chance of accomplishing these two purposes. And this might be something that you have some input on as well. Uh, and this is something else that I'd invite you to comment on in, and make discussion posts about in, the, in that part of the Canvas site. Um, when I do this with my intro students or my ethics students and I'm presenting it as a proposal to the class, I tell them, uh, you know, think about it as a contract in the sense that if you don't like the terms of the contract, propose some different ones. Like, this is not me just laying down the law of my class, but um, you are invited to also critically think about it and, and make suggestions about it. So if, you, if you've got some ideas for principles you think should be added from the code, added to the code, taken away from it, or maybe modified, I would love to hear your ideas about that. Please feel free to post them. Or, or if you just want to call me up and talk about it, I'd love to hear from you that way too. Um, the other thing that I really, really like about this version is just that it includes the ethical component. And I think oftentimes this is missing from a discussion of intellectual virtues. Um, I, I've met many philosophers who are absolutely sincere in trying to get at the truth. They're not intending to be abusive or they're not like, uh, their goal in engaging in debate is not a sense of arrogance or trying to prove that they're better than everyone else or something like that, um, or intentionally manipulative. But they're, they're kind of like toddlers, uh, to be honest. They're, they're sincere, but they're just unaware of what havoc they might be um, making in, in their pursuit of the truth. You know, they just kind of plow ahead toward that and don't see maybe the social or emotional or relational wasteland that they're leaving in their wake. Um, it's uh, like, for example, someone might not be intending to be a bully, but they are bullying in a conversation. That can absolutely happen. They might not be intending to be insensitive to the experience of their conversational partner, um, but they are, in, a, in fact, doing so. They might not intend to be disrespectful, but are actually, in terms of their behavior, being disrespectful. So it doesn't always require the explicit intention. We're just concerned about the behavior sometimes, too. Right? That's, that's also something that's ethically significant. Um, so the fact that this is explicitly on the radar and as a, a stated priority, I think, is a really cool thing about the code. Um, and I, I told you last time, I'm an ethicist, so I, and I said I'd be bringing an ethical lens to uh, this, but, um, uh, so of course I appreciate this, but I think that's very important to do, and not just because I'm an ethicist. Actually, there's a lot of philosophers more recently who have become mm, more interested in working on the ethical implications of epistemology. And epistemology is an area of philosophy that's all about knowledge. How do you have knowledge? And part of any epistemic theory is going to be standards of critical reasoning. So this class fits into the umbrella of epistemology. But there have been a lot more philosophers working recently who are recognizing how, uh, how we engage with knowledge and truth has some very interesting ethical dilemmas to it. And we can talk about things like epistemic injustice. Uh, how we might treat each other um, in, in immoral ways or in unjust ways with respect to uh, people's knowledge, their ability to have knowledge, how we pursue knowledge, um, how we have like a, a intellectual community that's trying to do that. Um, really interesting stuff. So um, that's, that's an angle here that I also appreciate about Edward's efforts with this particular version of the code. Um, I'll have some more things to say about this ethical component here in a second, um, and especially in terms of it's, if anyone's sort of thinking it might be superfluous. So I'm going to come back to that theme here in a second. But first, let's just talk about what these uh, standards are, what they're talking about. There, there's some little things to point out about it. You'll notice the first one here, the procedural standard, that says that the rules that, when followed, most often lead to, one, the successful resolution of issues, two, the most rationally endorsed beliefs, and we hope, three, the truth. Um, you'll notice there's three things there. And 
they are related to each other while being importantly different. Um, and I actually kind of wish that they were put in the opposite order. Truth first, rationally endorsed beliefs second, successful resolution of issues third. And the reason is, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, I don't know if anyone's read the Tao Te Ching, um, very uh, interesting text. Uh, and there's a number of issue, uh, moments in the Tao Te Ching where it's talking about various virtues and ideal living. This is from uh, Taoism. Uh, and they'll, it'll describe like, this is the most ideal thing. But if this can't happen, here's the next best thing. And if that can't happen, here's the next best thing and the next best thing. And then usually at the bottom of the list is like what we consider common sense. It's very interesting, these like tiers of ideals and a recognition of sort of practical complications. But one really big thing I appreciate about that uh, approach from the Tao Te Ching is how it's, it's avoiding all or nothing thinking. Um, it's not like, uh, there's actually a fallacy about it, the fallacy of perfection. It's not like the perfect or bust, right, or <laughs> nothing. And uh, this happens a lot uh, with respect to the truth. Um, I don't know how many of you have studied philosophy in the past or have any kind of exposure to it, but if you have taken some philosophy, then you probably know that getting at the truth is notoriously difficult. And I'm not uh, trying to diminish in any way the kind of progress or knowledge that we have. I'm not a global skeptic or anything like that, or that I want to drag everything down to the same level. Uh, like pseudoscience and science and legitimate science or something like that. I'm not saying they're equivalent, but it's just when we've tried our damnedest to get at absolute certainty of reality, um, humans in the course of doing that absolutely sincerely have run into difficulties that they have trouble resolving. And this is, and they are very deep difficulties. They aren't just the kind of like basic level skepticism or confusion that happens uh, or these false equivalences or things like that. But it's like some, some really fundamental assumptions that we have trouble defending and, and getting absolute certainty about things very, very difficult to actually do. You'll see this demonstrated through the course curriculum, I think, in, in part as well. We're not going to be getting into all the philosophical foundations of these concerns of skepticism that threaten our ability to have knowledge of the truth or the bigger metaphysical issues about, you know, like, are we in the matrix or not, stuff like that. We're not going to get in all that, but I think you'll still see how uh, shouldering your burden of proof to absolute, to create an absolute proof for something is very, very difficult to actually pull off in practice. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, everything that's a part of uh, rigorous rational reflection is a waste of time or useless or something like that. Um, that kind of fatalism is, uh, is not a conclusion you can jump to immediately. There are some people in philosophy that argue for rational fatalism. Um, they are definitely fringe views, I would say, to a certain extent, at least in Western analytic philosophy. There's some other intellectual communities where it's a little bit more prominent uh, and popular. Um, but that's a, they, even those positions that are very, very skeptical of rationality writ large are not doing so in this like straightforward way of, well, you can't have absolute certainty, so what's the point kind of thing. Um, they have to give much more sophisticated justifications for this. And the reason that they do and why their burden of proof for rational fatalism is so high is because there are a lot of obvious things that rationality can provide short of absolute certainty that seem very justifiable. Um, and productive. And that's where we're getting with the other two things that are on this list here. So if you can't get at the truth, what's the next best thing? And it's a kind of uh, a little bit more modest than saying I know exactly what the truth is, um, that absolute conviction or confidence. Um, but it's trying to figure out, okay, even if we can't figure out with, a per per with perfection what is the truth? We can figure out what is the most rationally defensible position to believe in or to endorse. So even if I'm like, well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this, it could be in the matrix, um, I still can ask myself, well, of all the options for belief that I've got in front of me, which one holds the most water, given everything we've got so far? So looking at the arguments on behalf of this, on behalf of this, on behalf of this, 
which one seems like it has the most defense behind it, and not just seems, but under analysis, under very rigorous analysis and reflection, which one uh, is the most rationally recommended. Um, and that's going to be a moving target. That'll change over time. But it's not like when we decide to believe in something that we're choosing to chisel something into our mind that we're never able to rethink ever again or something. Um, having conviction is not going to be opposed to open-mindedness. I'll talk about that with the fallibility principle, but that theme's going to be coming down here soon too. Um, so there's there's a way, it, this, a really good example of this is actually the history of science. So the scientific tradition, you know, people are trying to uh, shoulder a burden of proof for the theories that they're giving about the nature of physical reality, um, making observations, um, analyzing that data, and seeing which hypothesis fits the best. And people give their best efforts and they're like, this looks pretty solid. Like this answer, boom, this is it. Like when Newton uh, publishes his Principia and everyone's like, bam, Newton's laws, that's pretty solid. Like this is it. And, uh, and there was a lot of conviction and confidence about that for a long time. And then it changed, right? Then, you know, just I'm really surface level here. There's, this happens a ton. There's a lot of examples I could bring up. But just look at, like, Newton to Einstein. I mean, Einstein's like, this isn't working. We're now able to make some new observations we weren't able to make before. We also have some better arguments here for what is going to make for the best explanation. Um, and Newton just doesn't cut it anymore. And here's another theory that does solve the problems that Newton's theory has. This is the one that now is the most rationally defensible. And there's some tension here with quantum physics and quantum mechanics, uh, quantum phenomenon, that doesn't quite fit into Einstein's theory. So we think maybe that's going to have to change too at some point. Um, and it's reasonable to expect that what science is going to look like 100 years from now, 200 years from now, 500 years from now, is going to look drastically different than what we're doing right now. Uh, it would be safe to assume that all of our current scientific theories are false. And actually, if, if you talk to modern day physicists, they're like, yeah, we know they're false. Because <laughs> we've got things here and things here that are some of the most directly provable things we've ever been able to do, and they're incompatible. So we know that our understanding, our theoretical models, are, are inadequate. Um, they can't be how things just are. Um, but that doesn't like mean science is a bunch of bullshit, or it's a waste of time, or that we're not making any progress. Um, it's by actually recognizing the limitations that we get the uh, leads for what would be better, what would be a more rationally defensible position. And you can't just say, like, well, nothing is proven here, so I can believe whatever I want. Um, so this standard of determining what is the most rationally endorsed belief on a particular issue or position is still a very useful and fruitful rational standard here, that we would want a procedure, we'd want some principles or guidelines for how we're going to determine that. That's something that we can also disagree about. I mean, just saying we're not talking about the truth directly anymore, and now we're just talking about what's the most rationally endorsed belief doesn't mean there aren't just as high rigorous standards to this, or and that we also aren't going to necessarily agree about that either. Right? We can disagree about what we believe is true. We can also disagree about what we think is the most rationally endorsed beliefs. We might weigh those arguments in different ways. We might be using different standards of rationality. Like I was saying, there are some issues there that are controversial. Uh, philosophers are very interested in understanding the nature of reason itself. That's an object of study, which we have disagreements about. So that's why there, there still is room for debate, even when we're moving the, the goalposts, so to speak, to this next best thing of most rationally endorsed beliefs. And even there, we may not be able to always get consensus. Um, there might still be skeptical concerns about that, about how to figure out what's the most rationally endorsed belief. Um, I like to use this analogy. Um, if, it, if, you, if any of you have ever had roommates or something, then you kind of know what I'm talking about here, or even just like live with the family. Um, when you're living, cohabitating with other humans, uh, people have different standards of cleanliness, right? And there's arguments about why one set of standards is like better than another, that kind of thing. Um, and it, there might be a question here like, okay, what is 
truly the most ideal set of standards for cleanliness, so to speak. And you might be like, ah, I'm not so sure that there's some kind of objective truth about that that we're going to be able to determine um, beyond all doubt, right? Absolute certain certainty about truth here. So you're like, okay, well, maybe we can figure out what's the most rationally endorsed belief set. So maybe you like sit down with your roommates and people give their arguments for why one way of doing this is better than another way of doing it. And it might be, I, mean, there, I have some optimism actually that that could be rationally resolved. We could figure out which one does make the most sense rationally. But um, I like this example because frequently those conversations don't end with rational consensus of someone being like, oh yeah, yeah your standards are better than mine. Um, I should do things like, you, you, you've convinced me, right? <laughs> um, we can be a little stubborn about those things. And stubbornness is not a threat to rational consensus, of course, because that's an irrational disagreement, not a rational disagreement. But um, it's just an illustration of how sometimes we might not be confident that we're going to be able to get at some level of rational consensus about what is the most rationally endorsed belief set. But the code is saying, even if you can't do that, these principles are still relevant and rationality is still relevant because it can help with this last thing on the list, the successful resolution of issues. And I think that this is, a, this is a really interesting aspect to the code of intellectual conduct. It's basically saying that whether your goal is the most idealistic sort of like ivory tower thing of absolute truth, right? Absolute objective truth of everything kind of thing. Or you're just talking about pragmatics, the practical adjudication of disagreement, like in the case of uh, living cohabitation, like even if you can't convince each other of one set of cleanliness standards as being the ultimately ideal one or the most rationally defensible one, um, you still have to figure out how to live with each other given the fact that you don't see eye to eye about that. And so the code is saying the rules are the same. They don't change. And that's noteworthy to me, personally, because I find this to be uh, a very common temptation that when it's like the optimism about this idealistic result of truth is shattered, um, when it's uh, threatened or compromised or um, qualified, that uh, we have a tendency to think like the rules are then different, that there's a difference between people who are idealistically trying to figure out the truth or or have the best beliefs or be the most rational and just the practical issues of navigating life. And the code is saying that's actually, they're, they're not any different. Um, it's not like things go from philosophy or science immediately into politicking <laughs> or something like that, right? Um, it's saying you're going to have to, you're still going to have to figure out what to do in the light of your unresolvable rational disagreement. And it's very tempting also to say something like, well, shouldn't the answer be agree to disagree or something like that? But that's not always the most successful resolution of disagreement or the, mo the most uh, appropriate way to adjudicate disagreement. There's some things that are just where the agree to disagree answer, the stakes of the issue itself are so great that agree to disagree is not the best way to go about things. As a really trivial example, this cohabitation uh, example I think works really well. That if you've got people being like, okay, agree to disagree, um, what you're basically setting yourselves up for is frustration and resentment. If everyone's like, okay, you're going to do your thing, I'm going to do my thing, those are not going to be compatible. You're going to step on each other's toes all the time. That's maybe not the best way to handle this. Uh, maybe there's some other options here. And figuring out what those options, uh, which options should be taken, you're going to have to do the, you're going to have to play by the same rules, the same principles here. So when I talk about truth seeking, which I've talked about I've dropped that phrase a couple times here now in the in the last lecture in this one. Um, when I talk about truth seeking and throughout this lecture, uh, treat it as code for all three of these things together. And and with a sort of dream that we'd want to get high up that idealistic ladder as possible. So it makes no sense to just stick around in the pragmatic first step if we're able to do step two or if we're much less able to do step three. I mean, if we can get at the truth, that would be the best. This would be definitely the, the ideal. 
And only if that's not possible can we go to the second one. And really, the second one's really connected with the third. The most rationally endorsed beliefs are going to be our best guide toward figuring out what is true. But there's some other philosophical stuff we can quibble about there. Um, but the treat truth seeking in that sort of whole mode. And if you had to think about just one, I'd say determining what is the most rationally defensible position is really that that's nine times out of ten the, the thing that's really relevant here. That what a truth seeker does is investigate critically their own beliefs, their own perspective, and the perspectives of others, um, not assuming that they are the best option to go with. But the the horse you ride in on the debate with may not be the horse that you ride out on, or that it shouldn't be the horse. Maybe someone's got a better idea. Maybe um, maybe there's reason to change your mind. Um, that's that's what uh, true seekers are doing. And what would cause that? What would justify a change in perspective? That there's another perspective that's not the one that you currently adopt that has more rational defense to it the more rational justification. Okay, so that's a little explanation, or a lot of explanation, about the procedural standard. I'll try to keep this moving along. I have so many things to say about this. I'm going to have to do a little triage, I'm sure. Okay, the um, ethical component, um, I think the first thing that jumps out to you uh, in looking at this for the first time is that it's pretty vague. So here's what it says. The ethical standard is saying that the code, the code of intellectual conduct is striving to be a set of rules that, when followed, constrain our behavior within context of disagreement in light of what we owe to others and to ourselves. The big hanging question is, okay, what do we owe to others and to ourselves? Right? That's, that's where all the substance of this standard is going to come from. And there's a reason why it's worded so vaguely here. Um, this isn't Edward Damer just being cagey or catty about it. He's, he's leaving it open because what we owe to each other and to ourselves, the subject matter of ethics and moral philosophy, um, is really one of the major topics that we want to have a debate about. Right? That's one of the things that, that's, things that we disagree about um, or have the potential to disagree about that we would want to be able to resolve in a truth-seeking sort of way. We'd want to use this procedure to decide the matter. And instead of legislating as the ground rules for debate that this idea is the correct one. Um, pardon me. Sorry about that. I had to sneeze. Whew. Okay. Thankfully, I got to the pause button in time. So... Um, so the code of intellectual conduct is, is really um, trying to set the ground rules for how we're going to engage with each other in context of disagreement, right? So imagine like this kind of absurd scenario where I'm like, let's have a debate. I'm, I'm interested in what you think about things, and I've got thoughts too I want to share. But um, when we're having this debate, here's a rule. Let, let's get straight on the ground rules here. You can never contradict anything that I say because I'm always right about everything. You'd be like, uh, I'm not going to play by that rule. Like That doesn't make any sense. How is this going to be a uh, productive search for the truth if we're playing by that rule? That would be question begging. To, to assume at the outset of the debate that I'm right is to beg the question. That's what the debate is supposed to decide, right? What position really does make the most sense? What is the position that most deserves our assent, our agreement, um, our endorsement? That's what we're here to try to figure out. We don't want to prejudge that. So the code is very careful to try to not presuppose anything that we would want to then explore critically. Um, now, I think it's not going to be possible to move forward without any rules whatsoever. So like uh, anarchy is not the option here. Um, having some principles to guide us here is important if we actually do care about getting at the truth. And I think the ethical thing is is going to have to be cashed out somehow. But it's still uh, worth maybe noting. So I'm about to do that. I'm going to share some of my thoughts about how to cash out the this ethical component with a little bit more substance to it. Um, but I think it's still worth recognizing that we want to be very careful about that. And whatever we do want to put in there, like I'll, I'll put my point this way. 
I don't think we can get away with zero assumptions about what ethics means as a way of per, per, uh, proceeding productively with uh, debate, with intellectual debate. Um, however, we do want to make that as thin as possible to leave as much space open for exploring in an open, fair way uh, what we should think about this stuff, recognizing and respecting the possibility of disagreement that still has yet to be resolved through argument. Um, so I, I think there is some low-hanging fruit here, though, that we can get at, um, in particular the value of respect, um, which is probably no surprise. I'm sure you anticipated that that was coming, <laughs> that if we're going to have a uh, productive debate with one another, um, then we have to respect each other. But there's a lot to talk about here about what respect means, and, and I definitely have some opinions about this that I, I would like to share with you and see what you think about as well. But I, I think um, respect is definitely um, a, a candidate here. Uh, I like the idea of also throwing in care, but care is a little bit more controversial um, than respect, I think. Um, so I would, I would offer that more modestly as a, a proposal about ground rules here, but I think that could be very helpful. Um, I also think, um, mm, well, there's one other one. Um, oh, the, uh, so from standard moral philosophy, um, there's a concern for people's autonomy and, and ability to be self-determining that probably also, uh, like human rights kind of stuff, that would also be relevant here that is not, it's still, it's still, it's, it's as controversial as care is. Um, but uh, I think that also would be a pretty helpful addition. But I think we can get away maybe with just respect. Maybe that's, that's all it would take. Um, just respect alone. I'd be curious about your thoughts about this. I mean, again, the question is also not just what would be helpful, but also what would be necessary. Um, so that we're not prejudging any of these issues. As if, basically think about anytime you're putting a rule in for the code, like the gr setting up the ground rules, anyone who stands against those rules on matter of principle is basically pushed out of the conversation. And we're trying to get as much into the conversation as possible. We want this to be open truth-seeking. We don't, the whole point of critical thinking is not to prejudge the answers. Okay, I, th I think I might be beating a dead horse here, so maybe I'll move on. I wish there's anyone. Is anyone in chat? Nope, still not. Okay. <laughs> um, but if you want to talk about any of this stuff more, I imagine there's probably a lot of tangents available that you, if we're in, in a class here with everyone, that people might ask some questions here. So don't be shy about doing that. Okay. Um, so let me talk a little bit about respect. I think this is one thing that is necessary, that without it, we're screwed. Um, we have no hope of being successful with anything that we're going to be doing here without this. Um, but I want to talk about, I'm going to use these terms for this. Um, I'm going to talk about what I'll call a superficial notion of respect, and then something else I'll call a deeper notion of respect. And I don't, I, I want to be very clear here at the beginning that I don't intend to use the label superficial in a pejorative way. I don't mean that it's something negative, uh, like superficial in the sense of being inauthentic or phony or something like that. Um, the superficial level to respect is absolutely crucial for my money, absolutely essential, can't get by without it, like very positive, good, etc. cetera. Um, but I, I do, I talk about it superficial and deeper because I think the superficial one is the one that's more familiar to us and something that we're usually thinking about when we're thinking about respect. And sometimes our attention on that might mean that we miss the deeper one. So this is, it might just be more like obvious notion of respect versus not so obvious notion of respect. That's all I mean by this distinction in term. Um, okay, so what is the superficial notion of respect? Well, it's really preoccupied with voice. So um, respecting people, like think about, um, I'm sure you've had classes before with instructors who wanted to do class discussion and said, you know, like, ground rules for this discussion, like be respectful of each other, like no disrespectful behavior when you're having this discussion. And so what would that mean? It's going to mean things like no name calling, no yelling at each other, 
that we uh, are not going to interrupt each other, you know, like give people time and space to be able to speak. Don't hog up too much of the space so that no one else has space to share. Um, that kind of stuff. And uh, like the really abusive behaviors are being rejected. And, and the positive value there, the, the notion of the positive vision of respect is empowering people's voices. That we, we not only want to listen to what people have to say, but encourage them positively to engage with us, to like be invited into that space. So respecting people is not just being like, I'll sit here and listen to you talk at me, but also like encouraging it, right? Like being supportive. Um, because like we've talked about before, or I've mentioned before, uh, you know, debate is already so um, risky and potentially anxiety provoking. It's a vulnerable space when you're going to give a critical defense of your perspective or to like kind of like spill your guts and say, here's what I am, here's what I believe, and here's why I believe it. And then everyone can be like, I think you're wrong, <laughs> you know, like you're opening yourself up to that. Um, so sometimes being, just be even being known letting people know things about you puts you in a place of vulnerability because maybe they don't like that or it they if they don't like you or don't like that aspect of you now you're a target right you there's um uh any anyone who uh is either um a member of of like a disenfranchised social demographic or who's uh been um subject to oppressive forces or you know they they know this um that, and even if you haven't had those experiences, maybe you might be aware of those features about how, like, if you are something unpopular to most people or whatever the dominant culture is, then you kind of, there's a risk that's involved with being known, being outed, right? Um, that you've got that going on in you. Um, then you can be setting yourself up for a target. So any of those kinds of atmospheres or behaviors that silence people, that shut them down, that don't allow their voices to participate is a concern for respect. And that's why I'm saying like, this, even though it's a superficial notion of respect, it's absolutely crucial. Because if people's voices are silenced, what kind of debate do you got? Right? If you're not hearing from everyone, um, what are your chances of figuring out what's the truth or the most rationally defensible position? You're, you just have cut off your uh, nose to spite your face kind of thing. Um, there's no purpose or function for uh, eliminating those voices. Um, this is part of the backing for uh, liberal societies uh, and having a value on freedom of speech, um, that this is important for, be, out of concern for truth-seeking. Um, silencing and censorship shuts down our ability to explore what's going on. Now, there can be some limits to that, as I'm sure some of you have thought about and or had debates about, about the, the limits of free speech and stuff like that. Um, but that's what we're talking about here with respect, that to give people voice means trying to give everybody voice. And there's certain ways that people use their voices which shut down other people's ability to use their voices, and that's a concern. And there, uh, I would be happy to get into a big debate with anybody who wants to about freedom of speech and limits and all that kind of stuff. But uh, I'll just indicate here while my hat is still turned that whatever you believe and whatever your perspectives are, there's a way to uh, share these things in, in a way that respects uh, disagreement and, and other people and, and um, doesn't take away their ability to have voice too. Um, there are certain perspectives, and I'm thinking especially from the world of ethics, certain values that make it really hard to do that. Like if I'm just like, um, you know, I'm open to talking with anyone who has a different opinion, but anyone who wears a hat I think should be killed uh, because hats are immoral and uh, go against our natural uh, state of existence or blah, 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 right? I mean, if I'm going to have a perspective like that, or if my perspective is that people who wear hats shouldn't be allowed to speak in society, that's my position. But I'd love to hear from the hat wearers what they think. You know, that there's going to be some, you get up into some edge cases here where maybe that can't be done uh, completely. But um, again, 
trying to get most of the territory that's possible here. And there, there are some tricky cases it's not clear how to resolve, but there's plenty of cases that aren't. <laughs> um, and this at least sets uh, a value for us to be pursuing. So um, there, already uh, you're kind of seeing from me here how there can be a connection between the ethical and the procedural standards. That um, if, if we're not respecting people in terms of empowering them to have a voice and participate in the conversation, then our ability to get at the truth, the most rationally endorsed beliefs, etc., having appropriate resolutions to disagreement, is really undermined. So that's one way in which these things are already connected. Um, but let's talk about uh, another potentially edge case here that's also really, really important um, that I think is, is capable of being resolved. I'm going to at least make arguments to try to attempt to resolve it. I'm going to keep my hat on backwards maybe for all of this because this is definitely my, just my two cents about how to uh, work with, with this conundrum. Um, but uh, take this for example. To go back to the classroom setting, you want to have a discussion. Maybe it's a poetry class or an English class or something like that. Um, and the teacher wants to have a, a discussion happening here from different people. Um, but it's like, got to respect people, right? And if someone shares and then another person is like, that's a fucking stupid idea. I can't believe you said that. That's not respectful behavior. Is that going to have a silencing effect on people? Yeah. That's creating a toxic environment people don't want to engage in. Why would I speak and just open myself up for being abused? That's a problem, right? But imagine that instead of someone speaking in that sort of way, they said something like, like someone shares their perspective, their experience about something, and someone else is like, I actually think that that's uh, misguided and wrong-headed and that we actually shouldn't believe that. We should believe this instead and here are my reasons, here are the problems I have with that, here's my objection to your position, your perspective. Something like that could also sort of feel like the first case. I could be like, um, I, I remember some classes I was in where like if someone did that, the rest of the class would be kind of like, ooh, like, oh, shit's going down, right? Like what's going to happen? Like tension, conflict, right? Immediately, there's that kind of reaction. And when we are uh, held critically accountable, we can have a response of silencing that happens there. We, uh, as humans, uh, it's my observation, that we don't like to be challenged. We'd much prefer to just go through life not being challenged. Um, and there are some people who are like, no, I love a challenge. Challenge is great. And cool, fine. Not everyone feels that way. But even if some people like to be challenged in some ways, there's other ways they don't like to be challenged. Um, it's been my experience. Even people are like, yeah, challenge, bring it on. Like, I'll take on anybody kind of thing. Um, it makes me stronger and, and grow and all this good stuff. Um, even there, there are, there, there's a kind of, uh, there are other issues that they're not going to be as readily willing to participate with. Um, and even for people who do hold that as a value, there's, a, there's just an aspect of human nature. I would probably bring in, in the ego here. The little Buddhist in me wants to start speaking about the ego. Um, the ego resists this. The ego doesn't want to be held accountable. The ego in its essence is interested in only itself. And that it is the, it has arbitrary, unconditional authority and legitimacy over everything and nothing, it's not, it doesn't serve anything else. It's not held accountable to any other standard. So uh, I do think that this is a human dimension uh, that we have to struggle with. Um, so that it would have that silencing effect in some cases, pretty natural, pretty reasonable to expect. But this is uh, a problem in as much as um, maybe there could be a way in which being respectful of people in this way would cut against the truth seeking. Why? Well, because we're going to have to criticize each other if we're going to be uh, truth seekers. If we're trying to figure out what's the most rationally endorsed belief, um, just having a class conversation or just imagine a conversation between any two people that's like this class situation where a teacher's like, will you share? What's your perspective? No one talk about it. No one, no criticism. This is a safe space, right? No criticism allowed. Will you share? Cool. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else want to share? Oh, your thing? Oh, thank you for sharing. This kind of thing. We're not going to get anywhere. Um, what we will get, we'll, we'll get to the place of learning what people think, but learning about what we ought to think, that's going to take some critical judgment. Um, and it doesn't mean we have to be judgmental of people here, um, but we need to be critical of ideas. 
And when we have our ideas shot down, that can be deflating. Um, and we can we can take it personally. We can feel that hit and be like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to participate anymore. Uh, if I'm just going to get shot down every time I open my mouth. Um, so if we were going to have a policy that said we have to respect each other, and that means no criticism, so much for truth seeking, like critical accountability is gone. Um, so that's a reason why that can't be all this, the the only story that we've got about respect uh, is just. Um, you know, um, giving people voice in a way that they are protected from any possibility of criticism. Um, the voicing is still going to be really important for what's to follow here, but that kind of basic uh, way of trying to uh, enact a, v a value or virtue of respect isn't going to work for, um, for this critical reasoning project. Now there's some there's another position though um, I'm not just beating up on one side of this debate the, the the position I basically just described and that I'm critical of is a position that sees the ethical standards especially around respect as being incompatible with truth seeking the kind of things you got to do to be pursuing the truth that there's in, a tension here and one side might say yeah in light of what we owe to others and to ourselves we're gonna kind of blunt our willing, uh, our involvement in truth seeking, right? Like, instead of having a critical discussion about what we should believe about this, we're just going to hear what people do think about it, and that's about it. And maybe we find that there's some things we agree about, and there's some things we disagree about, but we're not going to go any further than that. That's it. Just purely informative, no evaluation. Um, that's really blunting what we can do with truth seeking. But there's another. Uh, opponent of mine for the view that I'm presenting to you all here in this video um, that is similar to that first view in that it sees a conflict between truth seeking and these ethical values of respect but what it does is prioritize the truth seeking over the ethical values so what would this look like um, I've met m increasingly more people who adopt this kind of stance but they're like yeah, uh, to do truth seeking means you got to be critical, and that means you got to be willing to take your lumps. And if you're if you if you have a thin skin, or this like the whole I hate this phrase, but the like liberal snowflake kind of thing, if you just can't handle criticism, there's the door you can leave, and the rest of us will actually figure out what's true. Okay, um, that kind of hard nosed take on truth seeking, I completely disagree with too. I think it's making a, the same kind of mistake that the first one is, the one that's not willing to get into challenging territory out of a concern that it's going to be disrespectful to people. I think they're both making the mistake in assuming that respect and truth seeking are incompatible. And what I want to argue for is that they are absolutely compatible, and not only that, but they really require each other. And to prove that, or to make the case for that, that's where I've kind of come up with this idea of a deeper notion of respect that I want to kind of present next. Um, but hopefully the, uh, these two positions I just outlined are making sense. Um, I wish you were right here in front of me. I, oh, I love talking with students. It's so hard talking into the box all by myself. But uh, I can get over that. OK. Um, all right, so what do I have in mind with this deeper notion of respect? The deeper notion of respect is a way that I can understand respect uh, being expressed through criticism. Um, and I have a few ways to explain this. So um, I have an extended metaphor. I'm already at an hour right now. Uh, trying to do the extended metaphor. Nah, I'll try to do this really quick. Okay, so um, I like this metaphor of jackets. So I got this jacket here. Um, and the jacket represents our beliefs and values, our perspectives. And I like the uh, use of a jacket as a metaphor for this because um, we wear them. We wear our beliefs and values. They are functional. They're not just like a collection of trinkets that we store away in the attic and take out and look at. I'm like, oh, yeah, I love this belief that I've got, you know, and then I put it away. They're the things that empower and enable us to go out into the world and to act and function. If it's cold outside, you need a jacket to keep yourself warm if you're going to go and do some work. You know, or, or just go to the grocery store or something. So our beliefs and values empower us to engage with life and reality. 
Um, and when we go to the, d the table of the debate, this is another part of the metaphor I'm using, is um, like when we go to this relational space where we're going to get into a conversation about what we ag uh, disagree about and why we, you know, why we think one side is right versus the other, it's kind of like taking out our jacket and being like putting it on this table. You can see the table here, put the table, and putting it on the table of the debate. I mean, like, check out. Here, here's me, right? I put it out there in this public space for you to encounter, and you could be like, "Cool jacket," like, "Thanks for sharing," right? And that's it. And then you're like, "Here's your jacket back," right? And that's it. Um, and in this way, you're kind of you're you're listening. You're giving someone um, this minimal, like, superficial level of respect, and being like, "No, no, I don't want to see that jacket. Shut up." That, you know, you're not doing something like that, but it, it's it's a little weak, right? You might be thinking to yourself like, oh, this "Stupid jacket! I've never been caught dead in this jacket." But go ahead, this is your jacket. You know, different strokes for different folks. You know, different things. Um, live, you know, agree to disagree, that kind of thing. It's there's a, a way in which, yeah, you've been listened to, but you haven't been taken seriously. And that's the seed of this idea of a deeper notion of respect. Let's say I take your jacket and I'm like, well, "What if I?" Try it on. What if I wore this jacket? Know, how, does this fit? Well, this, oh, this, this fits pretty nice. Or maybe I'm like, oh no, this doesn't. I can't wear this jacket. Like this jacket doesn't make any sense. It's got these holes in it. You know, it uh, stinks. You know, like all this stuff. It's too thin. It's not going to keep me warm in Northwest winter time. Something like that. I mean, there's lots of um, reasons you might be like, yeah, I'm sorry. Thanks for letting me take a look at your jacket, but I, I can't wear this jacket. So when someone else shares their perspective, you might be like, what if I believed that? Maybe they're right. Maybe they've got a better idea than what I've been believing so far. But l let me try it on. Can I sincerely endorse that perspective? And as you reflect on that, you might be like, no, no, I don't think I can. There's some big concerns about this. It's like you can be as opt uh, open-minded as you want, and, and it doesn't really mean anything if you're just like, I like hearing other people's perspectives, but if you never think like, should I actually believe this? You're not really being open-minded at all. You're just saying like, yeah, I'm not. I'm fine not criticizing you, but it's like I'm not taking it seriously for myself. Right? And maybe you've had this experience before. Where you're like, you're you you he, someone's being nice to you, but it doesn't really feel like respect. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. A deeper notion of respect by offering the criticism to you. If I'm saying like. I think your beliefs and values are wrong, and here's my problems with them. It's not like every time you're receiving criticism, you're being respected. It's not like when there's a flame war on Twitter or something that all those people are really showing respect. I'm not trying to say that. What I'm trying to say is that that act of criticism could be a sign or evidence that that other person is respecting you in this deeper way where they're actually taking seriously the possibility that you might be right, that you might have the better idea about it. Um, so if, if someone wasn't, if someone's just going to stay nice and not criticize, um, that you don't have any reason for thinking that they are taking you seriously. So if someone does criticize you, instead of jumping straight to the position that oh this person is disrespecting me as a person or they're they're not they're taking away from my voice or something like that, it might be because they're actually not only taking seriously your, they're not only letting you have voice, but they're taking seriously what you do with it, how you use your voice, how you, what you have to express with it. Um, so that's why I think this is uh, deeper and important. But it also helps with this problem where there's no real difference between these two things then, in the sense that they don't step on each other's toes at all. This, If we respect each other in that way, in this deeper way, one, it definitely means giving people voice but that we're, we're also going to take it seriously enough to share our criticisms. Um, that's going to be helpful for the truth-seeking productivity part of it. Um, so uh, hopefully this is making sense. Uh, let me know if it's not. Um, uh, I wish I could know right now so I could like update my lecture at all. But um, this, uh, this taking you seriously thing I think is the key and trying to set up a relational space where this is something mutually understood. Like that you and the other person that you're in the debate with um, are like, we're going we're gonna to do this criticism. 
And the reason that we're doing it is because we want to hear from each other. We want to take seriously what each other has to say. I value your opinion, that kind of sentiment, right? Valuing someone's opinion doesn't mean you're necessarily going to agree with them. And disagreeing with someone doesn't mean you're disrespecting them, the person. It would, it, criticism of ideas doesn't mean a rejection of people, and that's really important. The same way that it's not like you're disrespecting yourself if you change your mind. Like if you're like, oh yeah, I used to think this, but now I kind of think that doesn't make sense and this is better. It, I, it's not like you're like, I'm disrespecting and disowning my past self as like an illegitimate human being who doesn't deserve to speak. I mean, this, no, we don't think that about ourselves. And well, maybe sometimes we do. Uh, I, I, can, I actually know of some cases where I've met people who are like, have that kind of uh, relationship with themselves, like a lot of negative self-talk and things like that. But we don't have to, and we don't have to do that with each other either. We can do something very different here. We can set up a different um, way in which we're relating to each other. Um, so it's also something not to take for granted. I, that's the other thing I like saying about this as being a deeper notion of respect, that it's not as obvious is that um, it's not like you can just go around criticizing people and then, you know, get worked up when they get worked up uh, because they think that you're being disrespectful. You know, I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just offering criticism. I'm taking you seriously, right? I think this is something that, given how much criticism happens in a disrespectful way in our society, especially today, um, this is something that has to be proactively created or constructed with the people that you're engaging with. Um, to make make sure that it's explicit and clear why uh, what's what's behind your criticism, what's motivating it, what's your agenda here, that your agenda is to take them seriously, to give them voice and invite them and want them to be a part of the conversation, whether you agree or disagree with what they have to say. Um, that's really important. I mentioned care earlier because care is also something I think is very compatible with criticism. Um, it's not like criticizing someone's views, even about deep-seated beliefs and values, is uncaring. Um, we don't think it's a good thing for us to be ignorant or biased or misguided or something like that. And if we care about how other people are doing, wanting them to be in a good state, then we'd want to be, uh, we'd be concerned about what they're believing and valuing too. Kind of like um, if you have a friend and your friend is engaging in a lot of self-destructive behavior, let's say, for you to not call them out on it or to like encourage them to you know, face some possible criticism about that means you're kind of uncaring. You're like, you don't care enough to do something that's difficult, like have that difficult intervention conversation with them or something. Um, I, I, I've done this with people I love. And you, there's a way to go about doing it the right way here that isn't disrespectful, but there is a way to do it that is respectful and caring. There's a way to do it that's uncaring for sure, too. But there's a way to do it that is caring. And after the fact, I mean, it's been one of those things that has, like I was saying in my last lecture, like builds intimacy. Um, you really value the friends that are willing to call you out on your bullshit, that they're invested in you being a better person. In fact, um, a thought just came to me. Um, Aristotle makes a big deal out of friendship in his ethics. He thinks uh, being a good friend is one of the most important virtues to have. And his conception of friendship is that friendship, friends are committed. What a good friend does is they're committed and work toward you developing your virtue. So friends develop each other's virtue. And that's going to require sometimes the criticism, right? sometimes the rebuke. Um, having that critical comment to offer. Okay, I think I've beaten this horse dead enough. Um, but let me know if there's some more things that are unclear about this. But this framework of um, s being sincerely concerned about the truth and also respecting each other ethically is at the heart of the entire code of intellectual conduct. And everything else that, all these other principles that are on here are very much mandated by those values. I can turn my hat back for this part. And getting into the principles themselves, let's actually start with the principle that is directly talking about these standards, and that's the truth-seeking principle. So the truth-seeking principle says that each participant should be committed to the task of earnestly searching for the truth, or at least the most defensible position on the issue at stake. Therefore, 
One should be willing to examine alternative positions seriously, look for insights in the positions of others, and allow other participants to present arguments of or raise objections to any position held on an issue. Um, this is really saying that uh, as a principle for how people ought to act in context of disagreement, that they should be truth seekers. They should be concerned about the procedural standard. <laughs> so effectively what's the saying is that if you want um, a set of principles, rules that when followed most often lead to the truth, one of the best rules to have is that people are concerned about the truth, that that's their agenda in the debate. It's like if you want to be the most successful at baking a cake, you should take it as your intention to bake a cake. So it's a really obvious point. This isn't rocket science here, um, but it is worth mentioning. And, uh, and I think maybe if it seems a little trivial on the face of it, I might be able to help uh, supplement the truth-seeking principle as it's articulated here to draw its significance. Um, and, and first, actually, before I do that, as a little quick side note, I wish that there was an equivalent for the ethical part, too. I think this, the truth-seeking, my first adjustment to the code I would make would be to have an equivalent, the, the ethical principle, like that each participant should be committed to the task of searching for the truth in a way that uh, respects what we owe to others and to ourselves. I, even it could just be built right into the truth-seeking principle, and I'd be pretty happy about that. Um, but it's like, if we care about rules that are going to accomplish both of these things, and it makes sense to have people in the debate who care about those things, then for the ethical thing that goes mutatis mutandis, uh, a Lat uh, sorry, it's a fancy philosophy Latin phrase, it just means in the same way, alike. Um, okay, so what is noteworthy about truth-seeking principle? How can I draw the significance of it? Um, I would also maybe add a little side tack on a little phrase at the end here that says, instead of other purposes in the debate, like ulterior motives. So if you want the best chance of getting at the truth in a debate, then you want people who are committed to getting at the truth and who aren't distracted by other objectives. So in, in some ways, I, I don't think I've met anybody in all my years of teaching and just living on the planet of someone who's like, I don't give a shit about the truth. Truth can go to hell. Just don't even care about it. Um, I love lies. Um, I've met some people that sure advertise like they're doing that, <laughs> or their actions sort of seem to suggest it. But I think even you put you pin them down, they're not going to say that about themselves. Um, everyone says the truth is good, right? Uh, and it's a really easy thing to say. It's easy to value the truth. The problem is not usually that we don't value the truth, it's that we value other things more than the truth, or potentially more than the truth, or that just distract or detract energy and effort away from, um, from getting at the truth, or at least the most rationally defensible position. Um, some really obvious examples are, uh, almost too obvious to mention, really manipulative things um, that are, are abusive, um, people that are arrogant uh, or just want to win or like cynical, say, political candidates who are just trying to win votes. They don't care whether their positions are actually true. They just adopt any position that will get them votes. Um, they'll say anything in a debate that makes them look good regardless of whether it really proves that their positions or platforms are more rationally defensible than those of their, the, the other candidates that they are in the debate with. Politicians are going to be too easy to use as an example for so many of these things, so I'm going to try to have some restraint about that. But, I mean, those are the things that almost immediately come to mind, that, like, you have a debate with someone, they're not really interested in listening to what you have to say, they're just interested in being right, like, rationalizing their own positions, um, they're interested in demonstrating their intellectual intelligence or superiority or something like that, and those, anyone who's operating with those kinds of uh, objectives uh, or those kinds of agendas, you know, that's not going to be as productive a, a, of a debate um, if people have those kinds of, of interests competing in the space. So um, that's pretty obvious, but there's a lot of other ones that I think we're probably more sympathetic to, um, but that I would argue are sometimes just as uh, destructive to a debate being productive at truth-seeking. And here's one example. So 
it might not be that I'm arrogant, like I think I'm so much smarter and better than everyone else, but it might just be that I, I don't want to look stupid. I want to save face. I want to come out of this debate with my skin intact or whatever I associate with my sense of my own dignity. Um, not not like true dignity, but maybe something short of that. Um, oh, I think there's a class coming into this room. I'm going to pause the video. Sorry about that, everyone. I had to relocate rooms. <laughs> in order. There's a class coming in. Okay, so where I left off. I was talking about truth-seeking principle and how even these more... Um, these. Uh, other purposes or motives that we might have some more sympathy with can still be just as destructive uh, in terms of undermining a conversation's ability to get at the truth, to be doing this truth-seeking thing in a, in a robust way. Um, and I was talking about uh, wanting to save face or just come out of a debate with your skin intact, right? <laughs> um, and the reason is that, take a, a motive like that. <clears throat> if I'm if I'm just trying to like demonstrate my arrogance, right, or my superiority, I've got that kind of motive happening, then I'm not going to be as interested in engaging seriously with criticisms or possible objections or weaknesses to my position, things of that nature. And that's a way in which it can, there's stuff getting left out of the conversation that really needs to be in there uh, to consider all the angles, right, all the different things that can be said in that debate that might be relevant for figuring out which position is the most rationally defensible. If I'm uh, looking to save face, I'm going to do the same thing, right? It's gonna, it's going to have the same kind of element to it. I also might not um, push criticisms of other positions or make as bold of statements as I might need to or get into riskier territory because I think that opens me up to criticism. But it may be something that's really important to share too in that discussion to be uh, weighed. Um, just it, it's going to be important at, in, for truth seeking to not be afraid of making mistakes. Um, so I, I think you're getting the point here from truth seeking principle. It's not so much about, in my view, it's not so much about just the positive commitment to the truth being valuable, but that uh, the concern about not having other ulterior motives that would detract from that. And the same thing goes for the ethical stuff too. Uh, okay, so that's truth seeking principle. That, uh, that's what I like to call the heart of the code of intellectual conduct, is this principle here. Um, similar to this one, we have the fallibility principle. So at the big picture level here, you know, we've got 12 principles on the code of intellectual conduct. Um, I think that they're usefully grouped into three categories. The first two principles here, truth seeking and fallibility, are principles that guide how we approach a debate, like as we, you know, step to the debate table, this, this like entering into this space, it's giving us guidance about how we do that. Then there's eight principles that are about like what we do in the middle of the discussion, like while we're at the debate table. And then the last two principles are about how we leave. So how we dismount from that debate and where we go from there. So these first two principles in being about how we approach the debate, it's like before the stuff has even started, right? Before we've even said anything or put any cards on the table, anything like that at all. Because, and it's about attitude. Um, and like anything about attitude, we have to be, in, in my opinion, very careful and cautious about this. Um, we don't, we're not mind readers. We don't know exactly what's going on inside people's hearts. And the fallibility principle is on the same level here. So um, you don't necessarily know what are the intentions of the person that you're having a conversation with until you're actually having the conversation with them. And even then, all you get to see is their behavior and you infer what are the underlying motives. That whole process of inferring about people's motives will be very relevant for chapter two's material uh, when we get into uh, theories of conversational implication it's going to feature very uh, centrally there. Uh, so we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, but th that's something I always uh, encourage in students to be um, careful about, about um, jumping to conclusions about the motives and intentions of the person you're in a conversation with. I think that's very uh, it's something to be cautious about. Why? Well, in my experience, maybe I should turn my hat for this. In my experience, 
when a conversation goes from, hey, this could be productive and useful and healthy, to we're yelling at each other and it's in the shitter, you know, like all hope for this being a positive encounter are lost, um, usually happens right at this moment that one party or the other or both um, stop believing in the goodwill of the other party. They stop believing in the sincerity of the other party. They they think that the other person is being insincere. Um, and they that whether they're right about that or not right about that, even if a, a mistaken attribution here, will cause the conversation to go downhill really fast. So in making accusations to your partner, your conversational partner, about insincerity can be can be very dangerous in the sense that you might just be destroying that conversation's potential to actually do something good. Um, this this gets into dicey territory, and I don't have straightforward answers for you. And any of the advice I would give about navigating this space would definitely one need to be taken with a grain of salt. Two, I encourage you to be critical about it. Three, uh, there's going to be exception cases um, for sure. There's certain um, instances where you know, thinking the best of the other person or giving them the benefit of the doubt um, can really be like just, uh, there, there's limits to that, uh, that you can become a doormat for abuse if you're not tracking that whatsoever. So that that's something I'm always sensitive to. I definitely have a more like hippie-ish kind of idealistic uh, vision for what is possible here. And in my experience, it's been pretty effective that even if <clears throat> I'm talking with someone who seems to be like obviously insincere, I'm not going to call them out about it. If I call them out about it, they're just going to get more defensive about things, and that doesn't usually go well. But if I sort of continue, I'm like, okay, I see what's going on here. But in terms of how I engage with them, I treat them as if they were sincere and just act toward them the way I would toward a sincere truth seeker, which again, like we were talking about, doesn't mean not criticizing them, right? Um, just offering the criticism be like, oh, yeah, well, hmm, I just don't know if I can agree with that position because I'm ramp, 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 this, this, that, and the other concerns. What do you think about that? Sometimes just treating the person as if they are sincere can invite them into actually being more sincere. I've seen that happen to a lot of good effect in the past. It's not always something that works, and like I said, there's edge cases for all this stuff um, that I'm, I'm aware of at least, um, and there's probably even things I'm not aware of that I'm missing here. But... Uh, I found that to be a, a pretty useful strategy. You don't call the person out about it, but you kind of work with it. Sometimes you need to take a step away and be like, okay, what, why do you want to have this conversation? Like, what do we want, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, what do we want to be doing here? Maybe we should restart, you know, or reset. Um, get on the same page about what our objectives are and how we can work together here. So much of the whole vision of the Code of Intellectual Conduct, I think I mentioned this in my last video, is really about switching the narrative of debate from being a competitive activity to a cooperative one, where even the person that you disagree with, maybe on something that really matters, that's like super important and the stakes are high, the, the most productive relational space that you can construct there, in my opinion, is one in which you and the other person see each other as being on the same side of the issue of trying to figure out what the truth is or the most rationally defensible position. You might have different ideas about it, but that this is a shared goal that really in debate, there are no winners and losers. There's only winners and winners, right? So like this person comes in the debate with one position, this person comes in with a different position, this person's position is disproven, this person's position is seen as superior. They both win. I mean, if the debate, you tested the ideas, and let them kind of go at each other, the ideas, not the people. Let the ideas, you know, be like criticized and everything. And then at the end of that debate, it maybe there's some clarity here about which position is more rationally defensible. And then it doesn't matter whether you started the debate defending that position um, or not. Like you're leaving the debate with better ideas than when you started. And that's the real goal. That's the real goal. And that the power of that is that it gives you some way to be working with the other person, not see them as the enemy that you have to fight or something like that. And so I've had lots of debates with people who are defensive, who are just looking to vindicate their perspective. They kind of have this closed-mindedness thing going on. And by just treating them with respect, 
and not pulling my punches, but um, not accusing them of insincerity or rationalizing or anything like that or being biased, of just like laying out the arguments, like here are the reasons why this position looks better. Then they're given another opportunity to sincerely engage. And they don't always take it, uh, but I've seen them take it a lot too. So that can be a really good strategy there. If you want to talk about strategies about how to deal with these difficult situations that can come up in the relational spaces of debate. I'd love to talk to you more about that. A question I'm always used to getting here in this um, conversation around the code is, what do you do when someone else isn't playing by the rules of the code? It does take two to tango here, but there's a lot that we can do to support each other, I think, and, and the strategy I just offered is, is one thing that I've um, that found in my experience to be uh, another option that can help there. But both of these things, fallibility, truth-seeking, they're about intentions. And you don't necessarily know about them. Um, the, the fallibility principle is really about being open-minded. Um, so the principle just says, each participant in a discussion of a disputed issue should be willing to accept the fact that he or she is fallible, which means that one must acknowledge that one's own initial view may not be the most defensible position on the question. It may not be true. Um, I imagine that if I asked um, all of you to like write your own code of intellectual conduct prior to um, giving you this version, that something like this, that everyone in the debate should be open-minded, would probably show up on almost every list. Um, it's another pretty obvious um, observation about how to idealistically engage in debate spaces. But like a lot of these things, I think there is a deeper meaning under the surface. And one of the things that is a complicating factor here is what does it mean to be open-minded? That's a real question. What does it mean to be open-minded? How would, what would that mean in terms of your behavior? Um, what does it mean to acknowledge that one's own initial view may not be the most defensible position on the issue? That's all that's meant here by uh, willing to accept that you're fallible, that you could be wrong. That's, that's the epitome of open-mindedness. But I've seen that there's some different understandings of open-mindedness, um, some that we're running around with or ways that we uh, orient toward each other with this value in mind that I think are a little misguided. I think they're missing the point. Um, let's go back to the attitude thing and the, the moment of entering into the debate. Um, a lot of us, with good reason, are have concerns uh, of going into a, a vulnerable space, a risky space like debate, of wanting to make sure that the person that we're talking to is someone who is open-minded. I don't want to just have this um, destructive, you know, uh, frustrating um, battle of wills with someone who's really stubborn and isn't willing to look at things another way and it's probably going to degenerate into a yelling match or uh, people's egos getting bruised, uh, disrespectful engagement, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of good reasons to be concerned, to be tracking, like, is this person open-minded or not open-minded before I really, you know, pour my guts out <laughs> onto the table and, like, open myself up to be um, vulnerably engaged here. Uh, there's something socially risky about doing that, right? Especially if it's someone you don't know as well. Or you know but haven't done this kind of thing with. Um, haven't gone to this like level of intimacy, so to speak. Um, and in terms of what we've got to work with uh, as evidence for people's sincerity and how open-minded they are at the beginning of the debate, we don't really have a lot to go off of. It's first impression kind of stuff, right? Just like their posture, uh, tone of voice, facial expression, initial personalities, all this kind of stuff. That, that's really the only evidence that we've got. And um, the thing that I've observed, keep this hat turned, the thing I've observed that most people seem to be keying in on is confidence. How confident is someone? Are they, do they think, do they feel like they've got the right answer? Or are they uncertain? And uh, and I think sometimes those pieces of evidence just get associated directly with open-mindedness and closed-mindedness, and that's not really appropriate. But I can understand why this might happen. People who are dogmatic and closed-minded and not willing to entertain that they might be wrong usually are pretty confident. 
and people who are open-minded, who recognize and are looking at different sides on a debate that need, on an issue that needs to be debated because it is rationally controversial, might you know, ordinarily be a little hesitant about a position because they're seeing how they're, this is a really sticky issue. You know, it's not so obvious what the right answer is. Um, so we might, that, that's the grounds on which I can kind of charitably understand why this associa association of confidence with, con, uh, and confidence and conviction with open-mindedness and closed-mindedness would like make sense. But I think ultimately it backfires. And I want to kind of uh, explain why I think that. Um, the most basic point is that having confidence and conviction is no sign of being closed-minded. Not in the way we're talking about it here, and I'd argue this is the way that actually matters. If you're willing to accept that your initial view may not be the most defensible position on the question, that doesn't mean you have to think it isn't the most defensible position on the question. Um, you could be coming to the debate table being like, I got a lot of ideas in my bag here. You know, I've thought about this before. I maybe have researched it. I've taken classes on this, perhaps. I'm like, I've got a lot of arguments to offer. Um, and I, the way I'm looking at this issue, I got this whole stack of evidence here. And the other side, I haven't really seen a whole lot from that. I've been looking for it, haven't found any. So I got a lot of conviction that this is the position that makes sense. But what could someone be also doing while doing that? They'd also be like, but maybe I'm still wrong. Like maybe there's something I've missed and I'm interested in exploring that. That's why I want to talk to you, person who disagrees with me, because that's the best person for me to be talking to to see if I've missed anything. I want to be talking with people that disagree with me to test the things that I have conviction in to see if they're really deserving for me to continue to have conviction in them or not. The mere fact that you have conviction in something doesn't stop you from being able to entertain other possibilities. Like I was saying earlier, it's not like when we endorse a belief that we're carving it into our souls and it's never going to be anything other than that from here on afterward. We have the ability to rethink our views and to just say, like, look, I got a lot of reasons for thinking this is true. Like, I think you've got your work cut out for you, opponent, if you're going to defeat this. Um, that's fine. And that shouldn't be uh, just because someone has conviction or confidence doesn't mean we should think they aren't open minded, that they, they, they could be still open-minded there. They shouldn't think that they're closed-minded just because they have confidence and conviction. So that's one half the argument. Um, the real, uh, well, no, okay, I'm gonna, I'll talk about that later. Um, the second half of the argument here is that uh, uh, someone being like not sure or have a, a lack of confidence does not mean that they are going to be open-minded either. So when someone's like, oh, it's just my experience, I don't, there's a lot of people out there have different opinions and you know, different cultures and stuff, I don't know about that, but, um, you know, here's what I think. Um, that person could be absolutely unwilling to engage with the possibility that they're wrong, that they don't have the most defensible position on the issue. And that might sound a little weird, but I think it's actually more common than you might think. Um, it might be that the person hesitates on something like attributing beliefs to other people or recommending them to other people to believe, but it might be that when it comes to their own belief, they're not willing to entertain anyone else telling them that they're wrong. Like as if um, what I believe is this personal sacred space that no one else can tread on or have anything to say about whatsoever. Really what it comes down to for me is that Acknowledging fallibility in practice is something you cannot see at the beginning of the debate. The proof will really be in the pudding deep into the debate, after the part that you know what each other's positions are, that people have asked, uh, have given arguments to defend them, you kind of got the setup for the debate going. It's only at that moment when the objections start actually flying that you really see what, what someone's attitude is. Are they going to engage with that criticism or objection fairly? Are they, are they interested in it? Are they inviting it? Are they, do they want to take a look at what it's worth? Entertaining objections doesn't mean you have to agree with them or endorse them. It just means you have to be entertaining them, taking them seriously, weighing them for what they're worth, and treating them as significant and worth responding to. But it, you can reject an objection. That doesn't mean you're being closed-minded. Um, because you're not accepting what someone else has to say. Um, so I think that's an important um, uh, acknowledgement to make. So imagine someone who, when the objections start flying, 
they say something like, who are you to tell me what I should believe or think? These are my values. These are my beliefs. This is my perspective. That, uh, the proof is in the pudding right there that they're not following the fallibility principle for me. And it doesn't matter how much they're insecure about attributing any claims to anybody else. If they're doing that, then they're not willing to acknowledge that their own initial view may not be the most defensible position for them to take. Right? This is associated with a philosophical position called relativism, which we might talk about a little bit. I'm not planning on doing a big lecture on relativism, but it might be something you want to talk about. Relativism is the position that truth is defined by your perspective. So every person has their own truth that's to them and is no one else's, and there is no universal objective truth at all. Truth is just whatever you believe is true. Um, it's a position that doesn't have a lot of um, philosophers defending it, um, but there are a few. They show up from time to time, and they kind of show up throughout the history of philosophy, too. Every generation, has, there's some relativists going back around, and I, I definitely see relativism in practice, at least, even if someone isn't like taking philosophy classes or something, being espoused and bandied about and that kind of thing. So I, th I think it's fairly common. Um, here, one second. So um, bottom line here is I, I think you can't judge people's, um, whether they're following the fallibility principle or not, whether they're open-minded or closed-minded, until deep into the discussion. Uh, and the initial judgment calls of like first impressions and things like that are not very good to go off of. Or at least you want to be very, very cautious about it. Um, and really, there's another point here. Uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned this with definitely mentioned this with my other class. Maybe I brought it up with you too, but um, so much of, oh, I think I talked about this with the fallacies in my last video, the informal fallacies. These principles on the code of intellectual conduct, I mean, you might be thinking about applying them to the person that you're in a debate with, like whether they're following these rules or not following these rules. But I kind of think that some of their biggest importance is not so much about how we judge other people's conduct, but tracking our own conduct about whether we're satisfying the code of intellectual conduct or not. So even if it's hard for me to judge what's going on with my conversational partner, are they open-minded or not, I can think about my motives. I can think about whether I'm willing to engage sincerely, seriously, and fairly with uh, arguments and positions that attack me, that, or that attack my, the positions I defend or believe in. Um, and I can think about whether I'm not only willing to tolerate being criticized, but whether I'm actually inviting it and, and enthusiastic about that, which is um, another kind of uh, tell for me of, of like this, the mark of the difference between competition versus cooperation as a way of understanding debate. Um, the, the person who is trying to win the debate as a competition would be mostly interested in just like sweeping the weaknesses under the rug, like we were talking about earlier. But the person who's interested in is a genuine and sincere truth seeker is really inviting criticism. They want to like test their ideas and perspectives up against the very best that could be offered about why they are wrong. And it's really not about testing you, the human, like my skills in debate or something. It's really about testing the ideas. A debate is not a fight between people, but it is kind of a fight between ideas. And I actually will, as a, in the, over the course of the quarter, use a number of martial metaphors to, uh, to explain certain aspects of debate and argumentation and criticism. I mean, they're, they're useful metaphors, but we just always want to keep in mind that it's not the people that are at each other's throats or something, but we're letting the ideas duke it out to see which ones are most rationally defensible and most deserving of our agreement. Okay, <clears throat> a, a good, um, another good example of how uh, this framing of debate that's approached sincerely as a cooperative truth-seeking project affects behavior in the course of the conversation happens from the clarity principle. And, and this is also just a demonstration of how the truth-seeking principle is like the heart of everything else. The clarity principle might look like another one of the most straightforward things ever. Formulations of all positions, defenses, and attacks should be free of any kind of linguistic confusion and clearly separated from other positions and issues. Um, duh, like debate is a communication activity, so you should be communicating clearly. Uh, that's a good thing to do. 
But again, there's a kind of deeper meaning here. So if what I'm really interested in is testing my ideas to see if they hold water, and that means I'm really excited to get some criticism going, like I want to hear what the objections are and see if I can deal with them, um, then I want to uh, basically free up as much space for that possibility to happen in the course of the debate. And there's a general principle, like I talked about with the syllabus and the, the schedule of, of curriculum that we're going to be doing, that you, you can't criticize something or you can't evaluate something that you don't understand. So listening always has to come first. So when you're thinking about it, having an actual debate discussion with another person, you've got to spend some time being like, here's my position, here's what's going on with it, here are my arguments for it. Et cetera, et cetera. That's going to take some time, especially if you're doing something in philosophy that's like really complicated or really abstract or very theoretical or you know things like that. Um, and if you if we have to spend like all of our time in the conversation just getting straight on what the heck I'm saying, then that means there's very little time left over for figuring out whether what I'm saying makes any kind of sense at all. So the reason why we want to be as clear as possible is so that we can get through that first phase, sorry, there's a camera here, that first phase of uh, being able to understand like what I'm saying so that there's maximum space left over for, for someone to respond with criticism. That's, that's the goal here. So the deeper meaning behind the clarity principle is why we want to be clear. It's, the, it's in order to be able to get more criticism. Okay, next two principles are favorites of mine. And actually, one of them never used to be one. Um, but these are kind of like two sides of the same coin. Burden of proof principle and principle of charity. Um, these are, are now getting into the principles that govern our behavior while we're in the middle of the debate, right? Um, <clears throat> the burden of proof principle, I, I'm going to just sort of summarize these quickly. Burden of proof principle is saying, you're responsible for your own shit, in, to put it crudely. And the principle of charity is saying, you're responsible for your opponent's shit, to put it crudely. Burden of proof is saying, if you're going to make a claim, you have to justify why we should believe it's true. It's not your opponent's job to justify that it's wrong. It's not innocent until proven guilty here. It's guilty until proven innocent. And what I, I used to not like about this principle was, uh, this is like back way ages ago when I was student teaching in grad school. I was just getting frustrated with how much contemporary philosophers sometimes get caught into this fight over who has the burden of proof. And it's like, that's not the point. Like, we want to test all the claims, right? All the ideas. It's not like someone's position is the default one and then someone else um, is the one that has all the onus on them to vindicate why their position makes sense. Um, I don't think that's very helpful. Also, personally, I'm a little bit of an anti-intuitionist when it comes to uh, argumentation, especially in ethics. I'm, I'm pretty distrustful of our intuitions because they're so vulnerable to bias, especially cultural bias. Uh, what feels right to us is maybe just a matter of our enculturation. Um, and not a sign of like us picking up on something that's more objective and legitimate. So those are kind of some reasons why I don't like it. But I've come around on this principle. This is one of the ones I've changed my mind on with more critical examination. Um, and the reason I think it's actually a pretty cool principle to have is that it's really countercultural. Um, most, not all, but most uh, cultures for social interaction have this kind of um, uh, value on uh, social harmony. And, and I, I think this is pretty cross-cultural, where um, there's, there's a, a goal, a shared goal in a community. Like Just imagine like a casual conversation between friends. That it's like, you're not, you're not going to rock the boat. You're not going to create unnecessary conflict. And so if someone makes a claim, and no one says anything, then it's sort of like tacitly accepted, right? And it, let's say your friend makes a claim, is like sharing their perspective on something, and then you're like, whoa, man, I think that's really wrong. Then where's the attention? Everyone's like, oh, why do you think he's wrong, right? 
Like all the onus sucks onto the person who's rocking the boat. Like this better be worth it. If you're if you're gonna destabilize our social harmony, there better uh, maybe we're okay with that, but there better be a really good reason for it, right? Because we'd otherwise prefer not to do that, right? The person who raises the stink always has all this uh, critical attention that is launched onto them. And what the burden of proof principle is saying is that's backwards. We shouldn't have a culture like that where criticism is not being encouraged, where it's only tolerated if it's really worth it kind of thing. That what we really want to do in an open, truth-seeking debate is invite as much criticism as possible. So I, I like this, that the burden of proof principle is basically saying, let's operate in a way where no one needs to feel guilty or shameful about challenging someone else's perspective. That that's always absolutely fair. If someone makes a claim, it's always fair to just ask them why. Why should I believe that? What's the reason for it? What's the evidence? That's totally fine. And it's not disrespectful, kind of going back to my idea of deeper respect. Um, this, is, this is just a part of the territory. This is what we're here for. This is what we want to celebrate, not, um, not just tolerate begrudgingly. So um, that, <clears throat> pardon me, that, that I think is um, the underlying rationale for the burden of proof principle. The other thing though here, <clears throat> sorry, one second. <clears> hmm, <throat> frog in my throat. Um, there's a way in which this burden of proof principle needs to be sort of, in my view, uh, balanced out a little bit in the sense that um, it's not just a matter of putting the screws to other people and being like well why do you think that give me your evidence or I won't uh, I just you're full of shit or something I, I won't uh, respect you um, I actually say to my 101 students I just was telling them this this uh, beginning of this quarter uh, on my syllabus I say um, for class discussion purposes uh, respect needs to be a premise, not a conclusion. I'm, I'm sure many of, any of you who have done sports are probably familiar with the phrase like respect is earned, right? Um, but really for the purposes of open truth-seeking debate, I think that's a terrible principle and respect has to be given freely and then we see what happens with it. Um, but it's not a matter of like, I'm only going to listen to you if I respect you, right? We want to, we're interested in hearing from each other. We want to invite that rather than discourage it. So this thing of like, you better be shouldering your burden of proof or I'm just going to dismiss everything that you have to say is balanced against charity. So charity blocks that. What charity is saying, well, Edward, this is the one of the first big adjustments I would also make to the code. I, I don't like this articulation of it. The, the heart's in the right place here by Edward, of course, but I think his definition treats charity as much too narrow <clears throat> and that it's actually a much bigger thing than what he's giving it credit for. Um, but uh, the, I'll just tell you what I think the spirit of charity is in a nutshell, is that you're spending time trying to come up with arguments for your opponents. That's really it. So whether it's like the case that he's describing, where when I'm representing what my conversational partner has said previously in the debate, that I'm going to re-represent their view in the strongest possible light that I believe to be consistent with the original intention of the arguer. But I think the, the spirit of charity here rightfully extends to um, if I'm in a debate with someone and I just spontaneously think up an argument that supports their position and makes their position stronger or makes my position weaker, I'm obligated to share that, not sweep it under the rug and not avoid it, not avoid that territory. But I should bring it up and just offer it out there as a part of the debate. Or um, <clears throat> that maybe I should devote some time brainstorming arguments for my opponents to use. Um, we spend so much cognitive bandwidth in just rationalizing our pre-existing beliefs. Um, we, can, we can share some of that effort with trying to support and come up with the best reasons, the most sincere, legitimate reasons we can possibly imagine for our opponents. Um, and that's what I think charity is asking for. So uh, the idea of I'm not willing to listen to you unless you have good arguments to shoulder your burden of proof is like, no, you don't have to do that. If your opponent is running out of arguments, you can help them with it. And maybe you should even if they're not running out of arguments. 
Um, if you're trying to win a debate, charity is the last thing you want to do. You don't want to give your opponent more weapons to use against you. Um, but if you are interested in seeking the truth, this is one of the first things that's going to be on your radar. And that's why I like to call the principle of charity the soul of the code. If the truth-seeking principle is the heart, the spirit of the principle of charity is the, is the soul of it. <clears throat> it's a really good acid test for someone's intentions, like we were talking about earlier, whether they do something like this. Now, charity doesn't is not a foolproof thing in this regard, um, because I've seen people use charity in very insincere ways. Um, pr there are some pretty sneaky argumentative tactics that invoke that involve this, uh, or at least a show of charity. Um, so it's not the most definitive mark, but in in principle, this is exactly what true, true seekers want to do and what people who have ulterior motives aren't going to do. So, um, so yeah, um, very, very important principle, probably my favorite principle on the code. The, the olive branch of a charitably offered argument can really make a difference with someone if they're not already down with the code of intellectual conduct. Like, let's say they're like really defensive because they are used to having like combative debates. Um, sometimes it's a really explicit gesture to, to try to be like, no, I, I think this might, argument might help your position here. Um, what do you think of this? Like, show that you're not trying to straw man them. The, the straw man fallacy is a massive violation of charity, or I could put it the other way. Charity is the antidote to the straw man fallacy of uh, misrepresenting your opponents to be uh, weaker than they actually are. Or like this happens in politics all the time where people pick out the weakest possible opponents from the, from the uh, enemy camp and criticize them, like the most unfortunate soundbite or something, and, and then use that as the representative of the, of the entire position to make them look stupid. That's straw man fallacy, and it's terrible. And charity is the antidote to that. If you're ever worried about straw manning your opponents, I mean, some, some positions are just weak. Like, it's not like every position can be made strong. Um, but if you're worried about, am I guilty of straw manning? I, I want to make sure I don't do that. The best tool in your, in your toolkit here is exertion of charity, of trying to come up with the best things that you possibly can for your opponent. So, yeah, I've, I've, uh, like I said, I've, in my experience, I've seen that gesture make all the difference in the world to someone. It's like someone who's like really closed off like this and it's a little bit of like compassion then they, they kind of open up a little bit more they're like oh okay this is this is going to be a different kind of conversation than what I'm used to um, so that's a that's a really cool thing there was something else about charity here I wanted to share but oh right um, so there's certain contexts for argumentative debate that don't play by the principle of charity and they might actually be justified. I mean, one thing that might be jumping off to your attention here while I'm speaking is that this isn't how court uh, court cases work, right? You don't have the uh, the attorneys on both sides like helping each other out with their cross examinations or making their case or something like the closing statements to the jury, and then you know one one lawyer goes up and gives their closing statements, and the next lawyer goes and going off of what he said like you should have said this that makes it your position even stronger to the jury I mean, they don't do that right the principle is let both uh, attorneys just defend their side as aggressively as they possibly can and see what happens like hopefully this will get us to the truth now I think that there's some prudential reasons for doing it this way because if you had the attorneys kind of collaborating with each other there could be a lot of concern about impartiality and fair trials and there's a lot of room for abuse etc cetera, etc cetera. but in the context of like people just talking about the truth or having an intellectual debate with each other the principle of charity is absolutely appropriate um, I think I've seen it is there a text here oh no okay something here. okay I don't know why that was flashing at me okay um, so the, under certain circumstances, it could look a little different too. Um, I want to. I, we're getting at 154 minutes on this video, so I'm thinking about wrapping it up here. But there's one little anecdote I wanted to share before I, I left you uh, for this time. And next time, uh, I'll finish up. Uh, probably the Thursday lecture. It'll also be at 12:30 to 2:30.
Um, and I will uh, be finishing up the Code of Intellectual Conduct, and we're actually making halfway decent pace. I think I'll be able to start talking about some of the Chapter 2 material, too. But to close this off for today, I want to share this little story from when I was in grad school and student teaching this class for the first time. Uh, it's a very fond memory. So um, I, was, uh, I was giving this whole lecture about the Code of Intellectual Conduct and talking through some of the details about it. And um, this like being respectful to each other and giving each other voice and blah, blah, blah. And not being abusive, not combative, it's a cooperative truth seeking, all that sort of stuff. And um, the university that I went to um, had like a campus bar. And all of us uh, philosophy grad students, we would go to the bar on regular occasions. Um, and we would, you know, have some beers in the afternoon and talk philosophy and like talk about the papers we're working on, presentations we're giving, the classes that we're in together, stuff like that. And one of my students what, uh, for my critical reasoning class was there uh, as a server. Um, she was serving our table, bringing us beers and stuff like that. And uh, we're in the middle of it going at it and, and she taps me on the shoulder and she's like, Tim, can I talk to you for a second? I was like, okay. I'm like, what's up? I step away from the table. She's like, come on over here. So I, I like, we step away from the table, and she's like, Tim, I, she was so sweet about it. I mean, she was being very charitable. Um, she was like, but the basic gist of what she was saying was, um, are you a hypocrite, Tim? Because you were, or, or the way she worded it was like, are there like different standards? Is there something like you tell students, but then like professional philosophers, it's like different somehow? Like there maybe like a double standard here? Um, and, and her concern was that, she was like, you, you've been talking so much about how important it is to respect each other and to be like cooperatively working with each other. And, and here I see you over here with your peers, your colleagues, and you're just going at it. Like we're, you know, we're drinking too a little bit too, but we're like, that's bullshit. I can't believe you believe that. That makes no sense at all. That's like the most boneheaded, like we're, we're really going at it, right? Um, not, it doesn't look like Oh, it's a very like calm, civil conversation. We're just going after each other, um, and and she was like, "What's up with that?" And uh, I like to tell this story because we all have very different cultures of behavior around, well, really just relational spaces, period. But especially relational spaces around debate. And what I tried to explain to my student was that we are not violating the principles on the code of intellectual conduct because of the style of how we're interacting with each other. I mean, that group of people that I was in grad school with, I, I think our grad program was actually somewhat unique in this regard, but I've never been around a more supportive intellectual community than, than my fellow grad students in that program. It was very close, tight-knit. We were, a lot of other departments, academic departments, you can have like backstabbing and there's grudges and all this kind of crap going on. But we always were like, we want to help each other succeed. We want to help each other learn and grow. And, and, and we had a lot of trust for each other built up. And, and so when we were like yelling at each other and, and even some name calling and stuff like that, it wasn't really like we we're trying to destroy each other. We we're trying to help each other out. There's understanding about that. So when you're thinking about following all of these principles um, and what kind of behavior do they recommend, I think it's always worth throwing this caveat in here that it's really the principles of these interactions that matter. And there's a lot of different forms that it can take. And when you meet someone new and you're having a debate with them, the way in which they uh, act may not be encoded with the same intentions and gestures and attitudes as what those things would mean for you to do them or with the people that you're used to interacting with and stuff like that. Um, there's, uh, I went to grad school in the Midwest too, and that's very different from the Northwest. I've actually lived in the Midwest a couple times, but also grew up in the Northwest. And there's, there's culture differences there. I really think they're mostly overblown um, from living in both places and and being a part of a few different cultural communities over my life. Um, there's a lot of things that people are on the same page about, but they can misunderstand each other quite a bit because of just the style of interaction. Um, so there's, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat here. The most important thing is 
at least for the vision that we're getting from the Code of Intellectual Conduct, is building this cooperative relationship. And if you have two people that have different standards or different a different lexicon for these relational gestures, that doesn't make it impossible for you to interact, but it does mean maybe you've got to clarify that stuff or be a little bit more explicit about what you're up to and why you're up to it um, or what you intend to be doing with this, that, and the other thing. I think that goes a long way. Um, it lets you... Uh, it allows if you're honest about like what you're doing and you put put your cards out there on the table it, it respects your opponent by also giving them the chance to have a voice about that or to make a request about how to proceed together as a part of doing this activity of having the debate and making sure that it's what um, you, you're basically on the same page about that um, I think that's very 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 useful um, okay so um, the principles, the spirit of these principles is, is much more important than a do's and don'ts list. Um, but it is going to translate into do's and don'ts for sure. Um, and, the, and in different contexts that might mean different things, but there's still some patterns here to pick up on. Okay, um, I think I'm going to call it there for today. Um, I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope you don't feel like I've been beating dead horses too much. I, not being able to look at your faces means I probably err on the side of giving too many examples or repeating myself a little bit more, but um, I want to make sure it's clear. But we also are making decent pace on this. Um, it's a very short document. A lot of this stuff might seem like no duh to some of you, especially if you're already kind of enculturated into this way of doing things or you've had positive intellectual communities to engage with. I never took a 115 class all through my undergraduate getting a philosophy degree. It wasn't until I taught it that I was like, oh yeah. But you, you pick up on a lot of this stuff intuitively, I think, by just being a sincere truth seeker. But even if you have that uh, going on, um, I remember when I first taught this, I was like, oh yeah, mm -hmm, yep, I've thought about that. Yep, 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 oh, wait a second. You know, there's something else. Or maybe that talking about it explicitly puts it into sharper focus than what you've got going on intuitively, which is one of the themes of this class, making the implicit explicit. That's what this is all about. So uh, I hope you find this useful. I very much encourage you to make posts, start discussion posts, and reply to discussion posts uh, on the Canvas site. Um, I'll be monitoring that, and if I see questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, feel free to have conversations and debates with each other. If you want to debate with me about any of the things I've said, I've done a lot of hat turning, and I'm always interested in criticism and what else uh, might be something you want to put on the radar here for us. Um, even though we're not pledging, making a pledge here with this code because we're going to have big class debates and discussions, I would be interested to see if you have suggestions about how to modify the code and improve it and make it better. Um, so uh, share those things too. And if you just want to talk, I'd love to do it. No one's called me up yet so far this week, but I look forward to the, any of those interaction spaces that I get to have with all of you. Um, so let me know. Okay, until next time. I just realized I forgot to give a code word, so let me just tack that on here. Um, oh, okay, I'll do this. Uh, the code word will be that bar that I used to go to with my friends in grad school. It was called the Pilsner Club. Pilsner Club. That's the code word for this time. Um, so put that code into, uh, I'll be making another quiz up on Canvas for you to put that code word in. Um, and, uh, and there you go. Okay, bye-bye.